Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mixing Tips webinar. I'm Bobby Osinski. I'm a producer, an engineer, a mixer, and a book author. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll learn a lot of new things that will improve your mixes quite a bit. By the end of this webinar, you're going to know some of the main tricks that Hitmaker mixers use to make their mixes more polished and more finished and give you more of that radio sound. Before we get started, I have a special gift for everyone that stays till the end. I want to give you a copy of my Mastering Your Songs in Six Steps ebook that will add yet another level of polish to your mixes. So stay with me till the end and I'll show you how to get that. So as I said before, I'm Bobby Osinski. I'm a mixer and a producer and a book author. And hopefully some of you have seen some of these books. I've written 23 books on music, the music business, and recording. Many of my books are used as college textbooks and recording programs in universities around the world. This is one of them here. This is the Mixing Engineer's Handbook. And this is the first book that I wrote, and it's been my biggest seller. And again, th this one is in probably more college programs than just about any of the others. I also write two blogs every day. The first is a big picture blog. It's a music production blog. And the Music 3.0 blog is a music industry blog that looks at social media as well. And then finally, I do a podcast every week. My Inner Circle podcast has interviews with industry movers and shakers, and that happens once a week as well. When I moved to Los Angeles in 1980, I started to take any job I could as a musician, as an engineer, as a producer, well, 1980, there wasn't that many producer jobs for me. So I took any other job I could, and I worked on a wide variety of projects. I worked on commercials, like that Scope commercial you see on the left. And I worked on some good movies and some really bad movies. A real bad movie is like the one in the middle, and a good movie is the one on the right-hand side. I've also done a lot of mixing along the way, and in 1992 or so, I was one of the first to get into surround sound. And I did... About 125 mixes for, oh, many of the music movers and shakers of the world. As you can see, Iron Maiden, and I did a couple of Who projects, and I think about three Ramon projects. I was lucky enough to do a Jimi Hendrix Rainbow Bridge project, and that was very interesting. And by the way, all of these are available on Blu-ray or DVD. But it, nonetheless, it was great to do mixes with some of the greats and some of the people that I grew up listening to and admiring. Just last year, I was lucky enough to actually have two hits that I mixed and produced. The first one hit number two on the Billboard Blues Albums charts, and this was Double Crossing Blues by Adriana Marie and her Groove Cutters. It's always fun to have a hit, and it never gets old, believe me. A little bit later in the year, I also was lucky enough to mix and produce a hit single for the rock band Snoo, and that hit number five on the iTunes rock charts. So like I say, it's always fun to have hits, and it never, ever gets old, believe me. I'm going to talk to you about some of the tricks that the A-list mixers use on their mixes. It makes them sound finished and polished. I've collected these tricks from some of the most famous and successful hit makers on the planet, like the legendary Andrew Sheps, who's done Adele and Red Hot Chili Peppers, among many others. Dave Pensato has done Beyonce and Pink and Black Eyed Peas. People used to go to him not to have million sellers, but to have 10 million sellers. Robert Orton, who's one of the up-and-coming mixers of the day, who's done Ellie Goulding and Lady Gaga, and of course Ken Scott, one of the legendary Beatle engineers. He was only one of five engineers that worked with the Beatles, and he also produced and mixed four of David Bowie's biggest albums, as well as some great Supertramp albums. And, of course, Elliot Shiner, who is one of the best mixers anywhere, who's done The Beatles and Steely Dan, among other people. So I've collected these tricks from all of these guys. And over the years, I got to know them, and they were very, very helpful to me in that they were always willing to help and always willing to tell me what their tricks were. And basically, the way they felt was, and I heard this over and over, I can tell you how to do it, but nobody can do it like me. So no one ever felt bad about someone stealing their tricks at all. Because basically, every project is different. Every mix is different. The musicians are different. The environment's different. Everything is different. 
So the best you can do is adapt what somebody is doing, but nonetheless, these tricks are very, very powerful. So what are the characteristics of modern mixes? Well, if you look at anything that you hear on Spotify or iTunes or Apple Music or the radio, for that matter, you basically get the same five things. So first of all, you get punchy drums. The drums are the heartbeat of modern music, of any genre of music, so it really doesn't matter. And they have to be punchy, especially the kick and the snare. So that's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is that the vocal has to cut through the mix. You have to be able to hear every word. And not only do you have to hear every word, there are certain nuances that if they aren't there, the mixer has to add in as well. So that's something that we'll talk about. Also, interesting tracks. If you solo up the individual tracks from just about any hit, what you end up finding is that none of the tracks are boring in any way. It doesn't matter what the track is, there's something interesting going on with it. And chances are that was added by the mixer. So all of this is cumulative. When you put all of these tracks together, all of a sudden you get that magic. And that's why you can't have a boring track. And also, modern mixes have very interesting effects. Sometimes the effects don't slap you in the face, they don't jump out, but nonetheless, they're there. And if you solo a track up with the effects and you listen to it, you go, oh yeah, okay, that's kind of cool. And then finally, all modern mixes are loud. Now, of course, this isn't always for the betterment of the song because sometimes you can suck the life out of a mix by squeezing it too hard and making it too loud. And that's kind of the trick, making it loud and still having it be exciting. So these are the five characteristics of a modern mix. So let's talk about the very first one, punchy drums. The kick and the snare are the center of the drum kit. They're the center of the beat. They're the heartbeat of the song. And it's extremely important that those things kick, that they punch, that they jump out of the mix. Here's a little trick that will show you how to do that. And it's different than what you see on most videos, for instance, that are floating around the web. This is a very different way, and it goes a little deeper into how to use a compressor, but you'll find it's very effective. There's a lot more to getting your drums to sound punchy than just putting them through some compressors. The best mixers know that it's how you set the compressors up that really makes a difference. So first of all, let's listen to this track. It has no EQ, it has no compression. All it is is just the raw drum track. Sounds pretty good, nothing special, but we can certainly make it sound better. And the first thing we'll do is, let's go to this compressor. This is the standard Pro Tools native compressor. And let's solo up the bass drum and add a little bit. This isn't the best sounding kick drum, although by the time we're finished with it in the track, it's going to be just fine. One of the reasons why I wanted to use this track is just to show you that sometimes you are forced to work with tracks that aren't quite optimum and still make them work, and you certainly can. Listen to what we have now with 60B compression. Now what we're going to do is actually adjust the release. The release is more important than anything else here because what it's going to do is add body to the track. Watch. And if you take notice on the gain reduction meter, I'm trying to make it breathe with the track. We can also set our attack time, but what we want to do is set it very slow because we want those attacks to get through. Watch what happens if I set it fast. There's a lot more compression that happens because the compressor is working on those attacks first, and we want the attack to get through and just have the compressor work on the body of the sound on the release. So anytime you find the compressor making your track sound a little on the dull side, it usually means that the attack is set too quickly, too fast. have a listen to the track.
take notice, it's louder when it's bypassed. And that's natural because what's happening is we're compressing it, so we're actually decreasing the level. That's why we have this makeup gain here, and the makeup gain will equalize the level between bypass and in the signal path. There we go. There we go, a little bit more punchy, and you'll find as you add EQ, it'll get more and more punchy. And now let's go to the snare drum. The snare drum has a top and bottom mic, and I have them mixed through a separate subgroup. And the reason why I'm doing that is once we get the balance, that's not going to change too much. And it's better to equalize and compress just a subgroup so you get both drums together rather than having to do each one individually. Because generally speaking, it's more or less the same settings. And not always, but more or less. And what ends up happening is you're adding a lot more system resources that you probably don't need to. So let's have a listen. Okay, sounds okay. This was compressed during recording, you can tell. We're going to do it again. And once again, the real secret here is the release time. What we're trying to do is get more body in the sound. And you can see how it's breathing with the track now. You don't actually need all that much. 2 or 3 dB is usually enough. And now let's equalize the level between bypass and when it's in the signal path. Now you can really hear the difference there. Listen to the track. Here's our punch. So that was pretty cool. So if we recap how this works, the first thing you want to do is you want to put a compressor and a separate one on the kick and snare channels. Now, all compressors sound different in this application. So there are some that will sound better than others. And the best thing is to just swap compressors until you find one that works for the particular application. Sometimes you'll find that what works on one song, or one that works most of the time, doesn't necessarily work on everything. So that's why it's always important to listen and to swap a few things out just to see what happens, because the sound of the compressor really does make a difference. The second thing is to use only a moderate amount of compression, and that's 2 or 3 dB, not too much more. And the reason for that is, if you add a whole lot of compression, chances are you're going to squeeze the life out of the kick and snare. And you'll get the opposite effect of what you want. Instead of being punchy, in fact, it's going to sound flat and wimpy. So again, there's a point of diminishing returns here, and you want to hit that sweet spot where you have just enough compression that it's really kicking and it really sounds exciting, and if you go a little bit beyond that, suddenly you'll find that that excitement is beginning to go away. Number three in our list here, set the attack slow and the release longer. This is really the key to making this work. And it's the one thing that's often overlooked when you see videos about how to make your drums punchy on the web. What ends up happening is the attack is very, very key in this. If you set the attack too fast, what it will do is it will squash the transient, the initial hit of the kick or the snare, and it will make it sound lifeless. So what you're going to do is you're going to dial back the attack time until suddenly you begin to just hear where it's popping through, where it sounds punchy, and that's where you're going to stop. The release is a little bit different in that what you're going to do is you're going to make it a little longer because that gives the sound of the kick or snare more body. So you increase the release time and you increase it until it begins to pump with the pulse of the song. 
So generally what that means is just about the time the release time is coming back to normal, the next kick or snare hit occurs. And this is pumping with the pulse of the song, and that's what makes the drum sound punchy. When it comes to setting the ratio, make sure you set your ratio at 2 to 1 or 3 to 1, and everything tends to work better there. You get a punchier sound with lower compression ratios than you do with higher ones. So if you begin to go into the higher compression ratios, what you'll find is you're going to get the life sucked out of the drum a little bit. The punchiness won't be quite as effective. So keep your ratio to 2 to 1, 3 to 1, somewhere in there, and that should be plenty. And then finally, you're going to adjust the makeup gain control. So the level is about the same as when the compressor is bypassed. And the reason for this is you want to make sure that you're not being fooled by the fact that you've just made it louder instead of better sounding. So when you have the compressed and the bypass level exactly the same, you can tell. You go back and forth and you'll know for sure whether you're making a difference, whether you're making it better or just louder. The next thing you want to do is make your vocal cut through the mix. And sometimes what you really want is a nice airy vocal sound. And this is especially true if you have a female vocalist who's singing very quietly and up against the microphone like this. And in order to get that air, in order to make it leap out of the mix a little bit, there's a trick that you can do that will give you that, and it doesn't rely solely on EQ. Let's take a look at this video that will show you. Many pop vocals require some extra special fairy dust to make them special. Here's a way to add some extra air that makes it jump right out of the track. So first of all, let's listen to the track and zero in on the lead vocal. The distance between us can't keep us apart. Feel you close no matter how far you are. So it sounds pretty good, but we can make it sound a little bit more special. And we'll do this first by duplicating the track. And all we want when we duplicate it is just the active playlist. Okay, so now let's solo this up. And the first thing we're going to do is compress it, and we're going to compress it fairly hard. We'll just use our standard compressor here. And fairly fast attack time and a medium release time. Let's see what we got. The distance between us can't keep us apart. Feel you close no matter how far you are. Okay, that's a lot of compression. That's 8 or 9 dB. But that's kind of what we want here. We want it to be a little on the squash side. Next thing we'll do is we'll add an EQ and we're going to boost it somewhere up in the high range, eight, nine, 10 K, and we'll give it a fair amount. Now let's listen. The distance between us can't keep us apart. And we have a lot of sibilance there, but just before we take care of that, what you should do is have a listen to what it does with the track. The distance between us can't keep us apart. Listen again. The distance between us can't keep us apart. All of a sudden it sounds a little closer to us. And of course the sibilance is something we have to control, but it sounds pretty good. Listen to them both together. The distance between us can't keep us apart. The distance between us can't keep us apart. So let's control that sibilance there. And what we'll do is we'll add in, I usually like the precision de -esser. And that's what we'll add. The distance between us can't keep us apart. The distance between us can't keep us apart. Listen without it. The distance between us can't keep us apart. And with it. The distance between us can't keep us apart. Now we might want to play with these frequencies here because we're at 8K. What we might want to do is go up higher even, like 12K. The distance between us can't keep us apart. And it makes it very airy and breathy, as you can hear. Once again, here's without it. The distance between us can't keep us apart. And with it. The distance between us can't keep us apart. Feel you close no matter how far you are. 
Okay, for the awesome airy vocal trick to work, the first thing you have to do is duplicate the vocal channel. So in other words, you're going to make a copy of it, and then you're going to compress it very hard. And that's somewhere between 6 and 10 dB. You're going to hit it really hard. With the idea here is it's not going to sound good on its own, but that's okay. It's the combination of the two that makes the difference. So remember, if you're going to solo this up and listen to it, it may not sound good at all. The next thing is insert an EQ after the compressor in the signal chain. And this is important that it's after the compressor. If you set it before the compressor, then the compressor begins to work on the EQ'd frequencies. And that's not what you want. You want the compressor to work on all the frequencies, not just the EQ'd ones. Now what you're going to do is boost that EQ between 8K and 12K, the air frequencies. And then you're going to filter out all the lows below about 600 Hertz. So what ends up happening here is you have a very compressed vocal track that has a lot of the air frequencies emphasized. And then what you're going to do is you're going to nudge that into the mix until you can just barely hear it. And that's the whole secret. If you hear it too much, then the vocal is going to sound a little tinny and funny. If you put it up just under the main vocal, all of a sudden it gives it that air. It gives it a little bit of the high frequency element that it was missing before. And you didn't have to add any EQ on the main vocal channel at all. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, here's the next trick. As I said before, just about every track in a hit mix is interesting. When you solo it up, you find that when you go back and forth between the original sound, the original track, and after it's been finessed by the mixer, there's a big difference. And this is all cumulative. You put all of these tracks together and suddenly the excitement level goes up. So it's one of those things that it may not jump out by itself in the mix, but the fact of the matter is all of these things go together and they're really important. Probably the most boring track in a mix is the pad track. A pad track is an element, an instrument that's playing really long whole notes. And this could be strings, for instance, or a synthesizer, or an organ is always good for pads, sometimes an electric piano, and sometimes big guitar power chords. So all of these elements give you very long sustained notes. And what this is particularly good for is adding a glue to the track. Many times these notes aren't in the front, they're kind of in the back of the mix. So you would think, well, wait a second, it's in the back of the mix, so it could stand to be boring. No, well, that's not the case. You could really make it sound pretty cool. And here's a way to make that mm, not-so-interesting pad track a lot more exciting. Just because pads are used as an almost unheard glue doesn't mean they have to be boring. Here's a way of adding a little bit of motion that's both subtle and effective. First of all, let's listen to the song. We're going to listen to this particular pad right here. Now this is a mono pad. It doesn't matter if it's stereo because the same thing will happen. Usually what we'll do here is add a big washy reverb and that'll work. That will widen it out. It'll make it a little more interesting. But we can do something to make it more dynamically interesting. So what we'll do is add a ping pong delay. Now I can do this as a outboard effect. I can put this on its own group or its own channel. But in this case, we're just going to insert it right within the channel here. So what I want is a really long delay. So I'm going to go to extra to long stereo delay. And a ping pong delay basically means that one side is twice as long as the other. So it will bounce from left to right because you have whatever's on, let's say the left channel, the right channel is twice as long. So what we're going to do first of all is time it to the track. It's 144 beats per minute. And now on one side, we'll make it a quarter note and the other side will make it an eighth note. And what we'll do is set this somewhere around 30%. We want them both the same. So we'll say 34% on both of them. Now let's have a listen. <laughs> So we have some movement left to right. This is actually a little on the fast side. We want it a lot slower. So what we'll do is we'll have the left side as a quarter note and the right side as a half note. 
So the left side is 416 milliseconds and the right is 833 milliseconds. Now listen. <laughs> bouncing left to right. What we usually want in this case is a nice slow ping pong and the reason why is the pad is slow itself. That's why it's a pad. It's a very long sustaining note. The long ping pong actually works a lot better. You can make it a shorter one but for most songs this will work better if it's nice and long. You can even make it longer if you want. We'll also add some feedback here. So Maybe 18, 20% somewhere in there. Listen now. A little bit smoother because there's a couple repeats on each side. Okay, for the moving pad trick, the first thing you're going to do is create a stereo delay channel. And what this will mean is you'll just call up and insert a stereo delay. Could be any kind of delay, it doesn't matter. And then if there's a preset for a ping pong effect, that's what you'll select. If it doesn't have a ping pong preset, you can sort of simulate one. And you do this by making one side of the delay twice as long as the other. So in other words, if you set 150 milliseconds on the left side, the right side would be 300 milliseconds. This isn't a true ping pong effect because really, a ping pong effect means that some of the feedback from the left channel is being fed into the right channel and vice versa. And we're not doing this here. We're just making one side move a little slower than the other. So now you're going to send a little bit of the signal from the aux end of your pad track into your stereo delay. And you're going to find that there's going to be some movement left to right. This boring pad track suddenly has some movement going to it, which is making it a little more exciting. Now we can take it to another level by modulating that delay. So sometimes modulation is actually built into the delay. And if that's the case, all you have to do is dial that in. But if not, just get a phaser or a flanger and insert it after the delay into the signal path. And just give it a little bit of modulation to take it to the next level. Now you should be aware that the slower the delay, the better in this case. Because what we're trying to do is give it some movement, but very subtle movement. If it moves too fast, then it's going to jump out of the mix. And that's not what we want it to do. We want this to be a very, very slow movement left to right to just make it a little more interesting. And that's the moving pad trick. The next trick is getting big effects through very, very short reverbs. And I guarantee you've heard this on so many hit records already. And you probably just didn't identify it. Once you hear this trick and understand how it's created, you're going to hear it more and more. Every time you listen to something on the radio, it's going to pop out to you. And suddenly you're going to say, oh, okay, so that's what that is. Oh, okay, I get it. This is used all the time on hit records. Back when I first started in the business selling high-end audio gear, I took a hardware digital reverb bin for one of the biggest mixers of the time to demo. I was surprised that the first thing he did was turn the decay time down as low as it would go and check that sound out first. It turns out that this was the key sound of many of the biggest hit records, which we'll see in just a moment. First of all, let's listen to the track, and we're just listening to the guitar, but listen how the guitar fits into this track. It's just guitar, bass, and drums. <laughs> Now listen to the guitar by itself. It's not a bad sound, it sounds pretty good in fact, but it's only a single guitar and we can make it more exciting and bigger sounding. So I have our friend, the D-verb here. Here's what it sounds like and this is just the default settings. Listen to it. <laughs> Listen to the track. That sounds pretty good. We didn't do anything to it, but the D verb is a, a reasonably good sounding reverb. But we don't want a long decay time. The trick here is to have the shortest decay time that we can get. So let's have a listen when we bring it all the way down. We bring it down to 400 milliseconds. <laughs> Now 
Now, it gets bigger sounding. The real problem here is it gets boingy as well, and that's one of the problems with rather inexpensive reverbs, whether they be hardware or plugins, in that the long decays sound pretty good. It's the short decays that they get boingy sounding, but it still works in the track, so have a listen. So you can hear it got bigger all of a sudden. It doesn't sound like reverb. All it sounds like is a bigger guitar. Now we can do a few more things with it. Let's solo it up again. And listen when I increase the pre-delay. Now this is just about where it's timed to the track at 27 milliseconds. Listen in the track. Now you can hear all of a sudden it got a lot bigger and we didn't really do anything here. We didn't try to make the reverb sound better. The only thing we did is we adjusted the pre-delay time and we took the decay time down as far as it would go. Now this is using the Hall algorithm and there may be a better sounding algorithm here. Let's listen to the plate. Let's bring this all the way down. That goes to 200 milliseconds. Now listen. <laughs> That's not as boingy, have a listen. So for the massive track reverb trick, what we're going to do is we're going to get a reverb and we're going to take that decay as short as it will go. And this actually separates good reverbs from bad reverbs because you're going to find that this is where they're either gonna sound really good or not. Many reverb plugins and even hardware reverbs fail the test right here because they're going to boing or they're going to sound metallic and that's not what you want most of the time. So in fact you're going to look for a reverb that sounds very very smooth at its very shortest setting. Then what you're going to do is you're going to add as much as 50 percent of the reverb to your dry track. And the reason why it could be that much is the fact that this is a very dramatic effect, but it's one that isn't all that noticeable unless you're really listening for it. So you can add a lot of this effect to the track. Sometimes you don't need 50%, and usually you don't want to go much beyond that, but you'll find that you can go pretty high on this, and it could definitely work. Now, there's a couple ways you can use this effect. First of all, you can use it in stereo, or you can pan the dry track to the left and the reverb to the right. Now, it doesn't mean hard left and hard right. What it means is maybe you'll set the dry track to 9 o'clock on the left, and maybe you'll set the reverb to maybe 1 o'clock on the right. What this is doing is just widening everything out and making it sound more interesting and giving you a space rather than reverb. And that's what we're going for here, giving that particular element, whatever it is, an interesting space. The final trick is to make your mix loud. Now, you want it loud because you want your mix to sound pretty much in the same ballpark as the mix that's played before it and the recording that's played right after it because... If your mix is quieter than either one of those, some people think that it doesn't sound as good. Many people equate loudness with quality, which we know is not the case, but nonetheless, you don't want to take that chance. So you always want your mix to be as loud as possible and to be in the same ballpark, at least, as everything else that you're listening to. So here's a trick that I learned from one of the great mastering engineers, Eddie Schreier, and Eddie mastered so many of the masters from Leonard Skinner to Queen to Eric Clapton to Kanye West. So many great records that he's done over the years. This is a trick that most mastering engineers used to use during the analog days. So in other words, this is the way they set everything up back in the analog days. They still do it much the same now, even in the digital domain, but it's a little bit modified. That being said, you want to get the most out of your mixes without having to worry about going through mastering yourself. 
So what you want to do is just make this as loud as possible without jumping through hoops. Using the old analog mastering method is the best way to do it. It will get you in the ballpark and it will sound really good without you having to do much. You can send it to mastering after this, they'll make it even louder, or it can actually sit on its own and you won't feel bad about playing it up against other mixes. Okay, this trick is all about how to get a loud master. And this is basically for clients. If you're mixing things for your band, if you're mixing things to give to somebody else, if you're afraid they're going to compare it to a mix that's on the radio, on YouTube, whatever, a completed finished mix, here's how to get really close to it. Or here's how to finish your mix if you're not going to master. It's actually fairly simple and it requires a compressor and a limiter. So here is the mix without anything on the master bus. Now you can see that it's not terribly loud, relatively speaking, but the peaks are actually loud, it's still pretty high. And this is important because we want to control them. So the first thing we're going to do is insert a compressor and there may be compressors that you like that will sound better. I'm just going to use just the generic one here just so you know that it doesn't matter. You can make this work regardless of the compressor that you use. So now let's listen just with this compressor with the default settings. Now the first thing you notice is it decreased the level because there's a lot of compression. It's actually too much compression, so we're going to back that off and we're going to equalize the level a little bit. Okay, so now the level's about the same, but what we really want is hot levels, hot and loud levels. So this is where we're going to get our gain. Okay, so now we have a lot more gain, but if you take notice, we're also peeking into the red, which is never a good idea. Now take notice, I didn't change any of the settings, and usually what we want is a ratio that's very, very mild. We want it somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, something like that. So let's have a listen before and after. Here's before the compressor. And with the compressor. Now one of the problems is, once again, we're peaking, and that's not a good thing as far as distortion is concerned. In a song like this where it's hard rock, sometimes you can get away with that and it might actually add to it a little bit. But generally speaking, we want to stay away from that. So what you want is a limiter. So find a limiter, and in this case, there's usually some sort of a, uh, a limiter that's in the native plugins. I'm going to use the precision limiter from Universal Audio, it's one of my favorites. Now, watch what happens. Now we have the level, and you can see, we're just knocking off the peaks. Now generally speaking, you can get this really loud if you crank it up, but it also sounds very compressed. So what we're going to do is get our level from the compressor, not from the limiter. Now you can see it really got loud there. We got a lot more relative level. We're not peaking. And this is something that now you can give to your friends and they can compare it to some other songs and it won't sound like it's a lot lower in level than the other ones. So that was the hot and loud mix trick. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to insert a compressor across the mix bus. And of course, once again, different compressors sound different in this application. So there are some compressors that work really well that you're really going to like and others that won't. I happen to like the PSP Vintage Warmer in this situation. And sometimes I'll also use a second one. I'll use an SSL, for instance. But 
This will also work if you just use a straight up native compressor that you find in your DAW. One thing I want to make note of, what you saw in the previous video, you saw some overloading occurring. And the reason why that was happening is because everybody kind of knows that the metering in Pro Tools 10 is kind of suspect. It's never right on. Usually I listen to it. If I can hear it cracking up, then I know it's too loud, but I don't rely too much on the meters. I don't know anybody that does. So that's why you see some peaking there. It seems like it's clipping, but it actually sounds okay. Okay, the second thing you're going to do is add only a dB or two of compression. You don't need much here. And again, the more compression you add, it becomes counterproductive because then you begin to actually take the life out of the mix. So you only need a little bit to make this work. What you will want to do though, is you'll want to crank up the gain with the makeup gain. So in other words, this is where you get your gain from. This is where you get your level. Not so much the compression, it's the level. The next thing you want to do is insert a limiter after the compressor in the signal chain. And this is important because the limiter controls the peaks. The limiter will actually stop the peaks from happening. It will stop your overloads. So what you'll find is your stereo mix will not be overloading if you set the limiter up right. And the way you set that up is there's usually a ceiling control on the limiter and you set that to 0.1 dB. Many mastering engineers try to get every single ounce of level they can out of it and they'll set it even higher to 0 0.01 or 001. You don't have to do that. The differences are very small and you probably can't hear them your compressor may not even allow you to do that. So set it up to 0.1 dB, and that will catch any of the peaks before they begin to clip. Let me just say that there's a difference between a compressor and a limiter. Basically, a compressor is anything that has a compression ratio that goes about 10 to 1 and up. So anything below that is considered a compressor, and anything above that is considered a limiter. Dedicated mastering limiters have very high compression ratios. Generally speaking, they're 20 to 1, 40 to 1, 100 to 1, even infinity to 1. And that's kind of the difference between taking your normal compressor and cranking up the ratio and having a dedicated limiter. You'll find that if you have a normal compressor, and check different ones because they all sound different, and a dedicated limiter, you're going to find this works the best. So you're here because you want your mixes to sound more polished. You want them to sound big and fat and punchy. You want them to sound like they should be on the radio. Let me show you what I'm excited about sharing with you today. The videos I've shown you have come from my 101 Mixing Tricks online coaching package. Now I collected all of these mixing tricks from some of the best A-list hit makers in the world. These are some of the best mixers who have done countless hits that we've all grown up with, we've all heard on the radio over and over and over. And all of these guys were very outgoing and would certainly tell me all of their tips. And you can find some of these tips all over the internet, a tip here, a trick there, but there's no place where you'll find them all in one place. That's what 101 Mixing Tricks is. 101 Mixing Tricks has all of those tricks in one single place. It's the only place you're ever gonna find that. All of the tricks can be used on any digital audio workstation or even on an analog or digital console. Doesn't matter. The tricks can be used with any native plugin. You don't need anything exotic. If you want, exotic ones may make them sound better, but for the most part, the native plugins work just fine. So you don't need anything expensive. You don't need anything special than just what's available to you. And also, each individual mixing trick is on its own high-def video. So that means you'll be able to actually see what I'm doing. You'll be able to zoom in and see all the parameter controls and how everything is set. Now, 101 Mixing Tricks has over 12 hours worth of material. There's a lot of material in this. It's divided into five different modules. There's one module that's just for vocals and that's lead and background vocals. There's another one that's just for drums and percussion. There's another one that's just for instruments and instruments being guitars, bass, and keyboards. There's another one just for effects. And finally, there's another one that has to do with EQ, compression, automation, balance, panning, and all of those things that sometimes are overlooked, but really make a big difference in your mix. 
There's also a downloadable PDF overview for each trick so you can take it with you when you mix. You can take either an electronic version or you can print it out and take the hard copy version with you. The 101 Mixing Tricks coaching program also has Q&A webinars that happen just about every month and you'll get invites to come to those and also you'll be able to look at the replays afterwards in case you missed one. There's an exclusive Facebook group only for members of 101 Mixing Tricks. There's a lot of people that try to get into this and they can't because you have to be a member in order to get into this exclusive little Facebook club. You'll also get my personal help whenever you want it. If you have any questions, you send it on to me either in the comments section of a particular trick or just send me an email and I'll help you as best I can or save it for the Q&A webinar and I'll help you there. You have lifetime access to the 101 Mixing Tricks online coaching program, and it's available to you 24-7, so if you ever want to brush up on anything, you can go back and catch up at any time you want. No problem. Now just think about what your mixes are going to sound like after you've tried these tricks. Better mixes are really important because, let's face it, they mean more gigs. They mean more streams. They mean more views. And if you're trying to sell, they mean more sales. The difference between a wimpy mix and a really punchy, modern sounding mix is massive. People look at you different when you give them a better mix. And the fact that you know how to do this yourself, it gives you more confidence in how to do it. You can do it faster. You don't have to experiment as much to make it sound good. You have the confidence that you're using the same tricks that the A-list guys are using. So when you sign up for 101 Mixing Tricks, here's what happens. You go to the sign-in page. This is where you do it. You sign into your account with the login information that we give you. And then you come to this dashboard. And the dashboard will allow you to go to any of the modules, any of the bonus information, the Q&A webinars, all that stuff is very easy to get to. And then you'll see when you select one, you're going to, in this case, module one. And in each of the modules, everything is categorized. So for instance, in this case, we see just the videos for automation. We see just the videos for panning. There's categories for balance. There's categories for EQ. There's categories for compression. And this just makes everything very easy to find. So let's look at what's in each module of 101 Mixing Tricks. There's so many very, very cool tricks. Uh, number three, for instance, the pumping rhythm guitar trick. This is a way, again, to add excitement and to make a track feel better with a rhythm guitar, acoustic guitar that's drumming, for instance, how to make that just breathe better with the track. The mono listening trick, for instance, is another good trick. That's number 10. And that will give you the ability to listen in mono and make any tweaks in mono, and you'll find all of a sudden your stereo mixes will get better. And not only that, your mixes suddenly will actually work better on other speakers when you play them because something about listening in mono really makes a big difference. You listen in mono, you make it sound good there, and suddenly it just translates better. Ken Scott used to tell me the story about when he was mixing the Beatles that they would spend all of their time in the mono mixes and then stereo they would do them in a half hour because the mono mixes were more important to them and they knew if they got that right the stereo mixes would be very easy and they were. The dramatic panning outside the speakers trick sometimes you just need to go wider than the speakers will let you and this is a trick that will give you that extra excitement that sometimes you need won't use it all the time, but when you need it, you'll know how to get to it. Module number two is the Mondo Effects Mixing Tricks. There's all sorts of cool things here. The Abbey Road Reverb Trick, number 23, is my favorite. And what you'll find is once you use that, you'll use it on every mix from now on forever and ever. Because what that will do is it will make your reverbs and delays, for that matter, just blend in with the track. It will sound so much better. You'll never have a problem selecting reverbs again. And let's face it, for a lot of us, that's been a problem for a while where you add reverb and just doesn't sound right and you keep on looking and looking and looking and you can't find something that works well guess what the abbey road reverb trick will make it work every single time number 29 the haas delay trick is also very effective sometimes the shortest delays are the most effective 40 milliseconds and below is a haas effect where you can't actually hear the delay itself and this can be a very effective trick especially in stereo where you find that you have what seems to be a dry vocal or a dry instrument and yet it isn't it just sounds that way but it's still more exciting than it was 
Module number three is all about making your instruments much more interesting. And this is guitar, bass, and keyboards. So for instance, number 38, the Van Halen guitar sound. This is giving you the sound of the first three albums, basically, first four albums. And this is a very iconic sound. And it's so effective that you find it works especially well with the power trio, where all you have is three elements. All you have is guitar, bass, and drums. That's it. But it sounds bigger and wider than you ever thought possible. The Elton John piano sound. This is another good one. The first three or four or five Elton John albums had this iconic piano sound. It was very, very bright. And everyone tried to emulate it for the longest time and still do. And this is a way that you can get that same sound. The bass trigger trick, number 47. Sometimes you have a bass player that doesn't quite lock in with the drums. And this is a way to help it along. So suddenly the playing sounds locked together. It sounds much tighter. And this is without doing any editing. In module four, the wicked cool drum and percussion mixing tricks. All about drum and percussion. And you'll find some great, great sounds here. For instance, Number 63, the secret gated drums trick. There's a secret to gating drums. And you'll find that sometimes the way we think we should use it is quite the opposite of the way it sounds best. And this trick will show you how. Number 62, the Tommy Lee thunder drums trick. Sometimes you want insanely big sounding drums, just like on those Motley Crue records. And this is how to get it. And finally, module number five, some badass lead and background vocal mixing tricks. Sometimes you need aggression in a vocal. The vocalist didn't give it to you. This is a way to do it. Number 91, the amazing aggro vocal trick. Just gives that vocalist that extra cutting power didn't have before. Number 97, the Abbey Road ADT vocal trick. ADT is automatic doubling. And this came from John Lennon back at the Beatles. Lennon loved the sound of doubling, but hated doing it. So he asked the Abbey Road technicians to come up with a way to automatically do it. And of course, we can do something similar today. And there's lots of products that will kind of simulate this. But the original Abbey Road way still has its own particular sound. And many times this is perfect for a track. So number 97, the Abbey Road ADT vocal trick and so many other ones that will just make that vocal special. And let's face it, what's the thing that sells in a track? It's the vocal. One of the things about the 101 Mixing Tricks course is the Q&A sessions. So these are webinars that happen about once a month. You'll get a personal invite to attend the session. So you can be on the webinar and you can ask whatever you'd like. It doesn't have to be about mixing. It could be about anything. I'll be happy to answer the question, no problem. But if you can't make it to the Q&A webinar, we record everything and then post it later. So you can replay it later and then you can listen to a lot of the questions and they're all usually very unique. And this goes back a couple years now. So if you want to listen back to November 2015, you can. And again, it seems like there's different questions every single time. So you can learn an awful lot just from these Q&A sessions. 101 Mixing Tricks also has a dedicated Facebook group. And when I say dedicated, that means it's a closed group. You cannot join this group unless you're part of 101 Mixing Tricks. A lot of people try to get in, they can't. And the reason why, this is just for us. And it's a great way to share your feelings, to share your mixes, to share your tips and tricks and all the things you've learned, to ask questions of the group, and you'll find that you'll just get a lot out of it. Once again, there's no other place that you'll find it. So I have this exclusive offer for you. The 101 Mixing Tricks program is normally 497. We're running a special on it. It's $297 right now, but because you're on this webinar, you can have it for just $247 as long as you use the coupon code MIXWEB. So what you'll do is you'll go to 101mixingtricks.com to order, use the coupon code MIXWEB to get the special deal, but this is for a very, very short time only, so you have to act now. And not only that, the first 50 people are going to get a special bonus. I'm also going to give you this bonus mini course. It's called Editing Tricks of the Pros. What happens is when a mixer gets a mix in, 
Generally speaking, it takes, well, somewhere from a half a day to a full day of prepping it. Now, this shouldn't happen. It should be done on the production side, but many mixers are finding they have to do this just to get it into the ballpark to make this work. So there's a lot of editing that has to be done. The first thing is they have to eliminate the noises. So this is the way the pros do it, the way the pros go through and eliminate noises. Video number two is all about eliminating pops and clicks. Once again, this is something that's cumulative. You put together a bunch of of tracks that have little pops and clicks and you don't hear the individual ones but all of a sudden you put them all together and the noise just makes the mix sound muddy. Fixing track timing is important. Sometimes things just sound better when they're lined up a little better. So many times the mixer has to do this prior to actually getting the mix going. This is the way the pros do it. And it shows you the best way to do this to make your mix sound great. Video number four is tightening releases. That's really important because sometimes it's really easy to get the attacks, but the releases are overlooked and the releases really make a difference in how tight the song sounds. So here's a way to do that. And hopefully you'll do these things before you start your next mix. If you order today, I'm going to give you an extra special bonus. I'm going to give you a copy of my mixing engineers checklist ebook and the checklists are there to make your mixes more efficient many times we can get into a mix and we can stop and start and stop and start we can chase our tail because there's a bunch of things we overlooked this is a way of giving you a checklist so you can get through all those things and make sure when you get into a mix that's all you do you don't have to stop and start very effective i'm going to give this to you for free if you order today so once again, 101 Mixing Tricks online coaching package has over 12 hours of material, tremendous amount of material, five modules covering vocals, drums, instruments, effects, and things like EQ, compression, automation, balance. For each trick, there's a downloadable PDF overview you could either use on your iPad, for instance, or you can print out and take it with you to the next mix. You get my personal help. You get invites to the Q&A webinars. You get an invite to the exclusive closed Facebook group. And 101 Mixing Tricks is available to you 24-7, and you have lifetime access. So you can go back and check on it whenever you want, whenever you have a question, whenever there's a trick that suddenly you're in the mix and you go, oh, what was that trick? Let me go back and figure that out. And you can always go back and check in on it and get that trick and then use it in your mix. Now, you might be thinking that you can't afford $247 right now, but just consider that this is the cost of a good plugin. And you're going to get far more out of the 101 tricks than you are out of just one plugin. Let's face it, we all have a lot of plugins that we don't use. <laughs> we buy and, and we don't use them. 101 mixing tricks, there's always something there that you're going to use. And there's going to be more than one thing, believe me. There's lots of things that you're going to use over and over and over again. I'm also going to give you my full 100% money back guarantee. If you feel that the 101 Mixing Tricks program doesn't meet your expectations in any way, by the end of 30 days, you can just let me know. I'm really happy to give you your money back. And not only that, you can keep the bonuses and we can still be friends, no problem. Actually, in two years, there's only one person that ever asked for their money back. And the reason why they did that was they were short on rent. The guy signed up for 101 Mixing Tricks, and then about five days later, he sent me an email and he said, you know what, I hate to say this, but my rent is due. I don't have any bread. I really like to get my money back just so I can stay alive here. I was really happy to give it back to him, frankly, because I much more prefer that he be in a better situation than have the Mixing Tricks. That's more important. That being said, he's the only person that ever asked for his money back, and I was really happy to give it back to him. And I'll do the same thing for you. If you feel that it doesn't work for you, no problem. You have your money back, you have all of your money back, and you can keep the bonuses as well. I want you to remember this offer is only good until Sunday night. If you don't get it now, no problem. You'll still have the opportunity to get it later, but you're not going to get these bonuses and you're going to pay about twice as much. So there's an advantage getting it sooner rather than later. So what are some of the members saying about 101 Mixing Tricks? Well, here's Mike Oman, for instance. He says, the 101 Mixing Tricks course was eye-opening to say the least. My mixes now have much more density without giving up any clarity whatsoever. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you, Mike. 
Here's one from Rob Schrock. Rob actually is the producer for Rumor and 30 or 40 other albums as well. And he was also the Academy Awards musical director. So this is a guy that has a lot of industry experience. And Rob says, I've been doing this a long time, but I've already put three or four of your techniques to good use on recent mixes, and I'm not turning back. A lot of this is making its way into my mix templates going forward. Thanks so much. If it works for Rob, it could work for you, too. Jim K says, I really am enjoying the program. There are so many great tips for mixing, but more important to me are the little gems of information that come out that aren't actually part of the tip that show your wealth of experience and give me greater insight into mixing. I also like the fact that you explain why you do the things as well, because that's really important. What I want you to learn is why things are happening, not just how, it's why. So you can adapt these tricks to any situation that you have. That's really important. So after you sign up for 101 Mixing Tricks, just imagine what your mixes can sound like just after a week or a month. Imagine after a year what your mixes are going to be like. Imagine what it's going to be like when suddenly you have bandmates and friends and clients asking you to mix for them when they never did before. Imagine how you're going to feel after you know what the tricks of the pros are. Sometimes you're doing the same thing, but you just need that validation. You just need to say, wait a second, if he's doing it the same way I am, I must be right. Oh, okay, good. I guess I know more than I think I did. Click on 101mixtricks.com to get started. 101mixtricks.com. All one word to get started. You're going to come to this page. On the right, you see pricing options. And you can either pay with one full payment or you can pay with three monthly payments. When you make that selection, then you come to the next page where you're going to fill in your credit card information and you'll see where the red box is. It says click here to pay via PayPal. So if you'd rather pay via PayPal, just click on the button that will take you there. But this is also the place you also put in that coupon code information and that's MixWeb. You put MixWeb in there and you'll see the 297 will drop to 247. As soon as that goes through, automatically you'll be sent your login information. You'll get an email like this that will give you the login info. You can go directly into the 101 Mixing Tricks login page, get right into mixing, and then you're also going to see this bonus downloads. This is where you're going to get the Mixing Engineer's Checklist book. You'll have access to the editing tricks of the pros. All that stuff will be immediately available to you. So again, this offer isn't going to last for long. 101 Mixing Tricks is normally $497. It's on special now for $297, but the fact is, because you are on this webinar, you can get it for just $247 if you use MixWeb. Use that coupon code MixWeb. Go to 101mixtricks.com to order. The offer is only good until Sunday night, so make sure that you order now in order to get all the bonuses and the special deal. So thank you for attending the entire webinar, and for doing that, I have a bonus for you. Go to the order page at 101mixtricks.com, 101mixtricks.com, and you can download our thank you gift to you. What you're going to see is at the bottom of the pricing options, you see webinar bonus book, and it says free. So what you're going to do is just click on that, put in your information, and you'll go to the download page, and you'll be able to get your bonus ebook. So thank you, everybody, for attending. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them for you. Go to questions at bobbyosinski.com, questions at bobbyosinski.com. Send me an email. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Don't forget, the exclusive offer is ending soon, so go to 101mixtricks.com to order. Make sure you use the coupon code MIXWEB. That's MIXWEB, all one word, in order to get the special deal of 247. Thank you so much for attending. I hope to have you on 101 Mixing Tricks very soon, and I hope that I can help you any way I can. Thanks again, everybody.